We all watch the fireworks light up the midnight sky all the way to the dawn of a new day. Hello, my friends. Hello, everyone. I wish you a most vibrant year. And to you and yours, may 2022 bring you the best of all things to come. Now we stride ahead into the awesome possibilities of brighter days and better tomorrows. And what a better way to spend the first few days of the new year than reviewing Disney Plus's new live-action Star Wars series, The Book of Boba Fett. You know, I haven't shared this before with you, but Star Wars was the last film I saw before I was kidnapped at the age of seven. And Empire Strikes Back was the first movie that started resuscitating the child inside of me, bringing me back to life as I was rescued and returned back into the arms of my family and my beloved America. So whether you hold Star Wars in some special place in your heart or not, I'd love to hear what the movies mean to you. So now, sit back, relax, hold on to your drinks as we punch it into overdrive and get ready to enjoy. Now let's begin. Welcome, Slayer Nation, to the front line of fun and freedom with another episode of George the Giant Slayer. You know, I haven't seen you since before the first, so I just want to wish you a Happy New Year. How are you all doing today? I am so excited to jump into the season one, episode one of the book of Boba Fett, Stranger in a Strange Land. Now, Boba Fett is played by the powerhouse performer Temuera Morrison, and he's joined by Ming-Na Wen's Fennet Shan in an adventure that travels two Tatooine tales spread five years apart. Beware, there are going to be plenty of spoilers ahead. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe, like, share, and leave your thoughts about the video in the comments down below. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can be informed when we release a new video. Also, if you want a chance at winning either a PlayStation 5 or a Nintendo Switch, wait to the end of the video for more details. I'm going to be announcing the winners when we hit 3,500 subscribers. Now, the post credit scene of the Season 2 finale of Mandalorian were what excited fans all around the world about seeing a Boba Fett series. And as I shared in the opening, Star Wars was one of those bright memories that kept me going all the way through the dark winter year of when I was kidnapped. But Star Wars isn't just a story about right and wrong or dark or light. It's a powerful tale that'll lift you up and keep fueling your hope all the way till you find your way home. And you know by now, I love Star Wars, but that doesn't mean that I'm just going to simply rubber stamp the Book of Boba Fett out of some misguided or misplaced sense of Stockholm Syndrome loyalty to the brand. No way. It's going to have to earn its place in the sun all by itself. Period. So now, let's break down episode one. Stranger in a Strange Land opens on that familiar twin rising suns of Tatooine as it frames the mighty fortress palace of Jabba the Hutt. You have Boba Fett is in a back to tank, healing his body back to full fighting form. We get a first flash and we see Slave One on the landing pad in the cloner's world of Kamino from Attack of the Clones. Another flash and we see Boba as a child in the Petronaki Arena on Genosis holding the helmet of his father, Jango Fett, in his hands. A few breaths later, and we see the result of the events after Return of the Jedi, where Boba Fett landed in a Sarlacc pit. Boba doesn't want to spend the next thousand years being digested in the belly of the beast, so he steals an oxygen hose from the plasticine norm of a stormtrooper being slowly digested, and he begins burning and clawing his way out of the monster, all to the sounds of its heartbeats and squeals. That is my Boba Fett. I love it. Boba, finally free, he collapses on to the Tatooine Dune Sea. But hey, don't start rejoicing too quickly because he's out of the pod and straight into the fire. As a mischievous crew of Jawas quickly strip him clean of all his Beskar armor, his jetpack, and cool killing toys. And then, not before too long, he's tied behind a bantha and taken by a tribe of Tusken Raiders all the way through a sandstorm back to their camp. 
one of the really cool aspects of those scenes is that it was scored by Ludwig Göransson. That means Boba Fett had his own score, and that is really cool. You know, every time I see the Lucasfilm logo, all I can hear is the dom, 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 da, dom, dom, da, dom. I love the Imperial Mars. Dom, dom, da, dom, dom, da, 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 dom. Anyway, you don't want to hear me hum it all day long. So we're going to go back to Boba. Boba is back, but his life is now in the hands of this mysterious clan. He's tied up next to a Rodian, and he's waiting for Nightfall to make his escape. Well, as soon as that comes, he tries to use a massive's teeth. A massive is one of those uh, reptilian-style dog creatures. He uses his teeth to cut the ties that bind him, and he makes his break for an escape. But the Rodian has other ideas, and he calls out to the Tuscans and short-circuits Boba's plans. Now, this Rodian, in a cool tidbit, is actually voiced by none other than Sam Witwer. That's the same actor who voiced Darth Maul in Star Wars Clone Wars, Rebels, and Solo A Star Wars Story. Kenobi. <laughs> Kenobi! For as much as I love Star Wars, I've never had enough time to watch all of Clone Wars or Rebels. And I've been thinking about doing it lately. If that interest you. If you want me to review it, let me know in the comments down below. So we have Boba. He's quickly stopped by the roadie. And then all of a sudden you have a Tuscan warrior who challenges him to a fight and makes quick work of him, knocking him out. Well, his healing session comes to an end as he's also awakened by his indebted companion and the elite assassin, Fennec Shan. He's quickly geared and dressed up by a trio of droids in another one of John Favreau's overused homages to Tony Stark. Well, back in the main hall, there's a whole cadre of underworld criminals who are coming to pay tribute to the new daimyo on his throne. So Fed accepts their offers one after the other, and everything seems to be going great. That is, until one unnamed major domo for the mayor of Mos Espa arrives empty-handed. Now, this Twi'lek is played by none other than the comedic actor David Pasquisi. And he has the nerve to not even want to pay tribute to Boba Fett. That's even after Fennec threatens him. And on top of that, what does he do? He even informs Boba and Fennec that they shouldn't be surprised if they receive another visit from some of the mayor's alternate delegations. And we're not done yet. He has the balls to demand that Boba, of course he does this politely, that Boba pay tribute to his boss. Now, this is about the point that things started to go off the rails for me because my savage Boba Fett, the one that I grew up reading, the one that we just saw a little while ago execute Bib Fortuna without a second thought or losing a moment's sleep, he ordered Fennec not to kill the Major Domo. Instead, he spared him. My Boba Fett would have taken his head and had it sent special delivery and dropped in the mayor's lap. If nothing else, not to look weak. But that didn't happen. So I'm going to have to wait and see where this is going. But I'm going to give it three episodes and keep an open mind. Well, to finish off that scene, the smelter droid who works for the palace in Boba and Fennec, he brings a pair of Gamorrean guards. They used to work for Big Fortuna and they were loyal to him, so much so that they never stopped fighting. They didn't even give up. They had to take him in by force. Now, the smelter droid, he wants to send a message of power for Boba, and he wants to torture them so everybody can hear their squeals and screams. Boba disregards the advice, and he spares their life, and they agree to bond themselves to Boba. This is a bad idea. From there... You have Fett and Fennec. They decide to visit Mos Espa. They take a walk in the city, kind of like unobtrusively announcing their presence that Boba is the new crime boss of this town. They walk into the cantina where they are greeted by none other than Jennifer Beals, Garza Wisp. Now you can hear in the background and you can also see them. You can hear the Max Rebo band playing. Garza, she shows her fealty to Boba and Fennec. She polishes and cleans their helmet before returning it filled with credits. As soon as they leave the cantina, they're ambushed by, of course, what seems to be the alternate delegation of the mayor's men. These are assassins who are armed with electro staffs and red energy shields. 
pretty quickly, this really well choreographed action sequence seems to put Fennec and Fett off of their game as they're struggling just to stay alive. Well, coming in out of the blue are those two Gamoran guards who he spared. They quickly turn the tide and win the fight. Fett then launches a wrist rocket, which is another homage to Tony Stark, and he explodes a fleeing assassin. At the same time, you have Fennet, who's hunting down the other two, that they're beating their feet up a building, starting to parkour across the rooftops. She only needs one to interrogate, so she throws the other off the building. Now, the two Gamorrean guards, they drag Boba back to the palace and put him in a back to tank. And of course, he's going to start another healing session, which means we're going to take another trip back in the past through his memories. Now, before I go on, I want to say those two Gamorrean guards, I started to wonder by showing how loyal they became to Boba, helping both Fennec and him out. Was this the director? Was he trying to tell us, was Robert Rodriguez trying to show us, like, see, Boba's actions in sparing people's lives and not immediately killing them, maybe it's justified. I don't know. I'm just going to have to wait a few more episodes to make up my mind. So, Boba wakes up, back in his memories, inside the Tusken Raider camp. The next few scenes, they come across to me kind of like Kevin Costner's Dances with Wolves. We see a Tusken child take him, the Rodian, and a massive, and they go on a day trek. They walk for a little while until they come across a dune where they see a moisture farmer being robbed by a bunch of Nikto raiders. After that, he tells the pair to start digging in the sand for these kind of like little black melons that the raiders drink. It's some kind of milk. It's their version of water. It keeps them alive. So they do that for a while until the Rodian, he starts pushing away some sand and some dirt. And all of a sudden, there are some scales under the ground and a behemoth comes popping out. Well, the whole point of this scene, and it was really cool because it was a callback to Harry Housen's, you know, stop animation um, monsters from like the 60s and 70s. But what was the scene all about? That was to bond him to the Tuscan child. So he takes out the monster in quick order, and you see the Tuscan child walk back into the camp with the creature's head held high like he's the hunter supreme. And that's where we come to one of my most favorite scenes. Boba is standing back watching the entire tribe throw accolades onto the kid when what appears to be like the elder or the wise man of the tribe, he comes up to him and he hands him one of those black gourds. Now, water to the Tuscans is a sacred thing. And to watch Boba sitting there sipping that water as the episode closed out, to me, it was beautiful. I absolutely loved it. So what were my expectations for the Book of Boba Fett? Well, I thought we would be visiting with that notorious knockaround guy, where we would get to see the galaxy's most ruthless bounty hunter, the one that even Darth Vader had to order. No more disintegrations, Boba. No disintegrations. As you wish. When he was saying as you wish, what he meant was, I love you. Wait, just wait. I've always viewed Fed as a cross between the western squinty-eyed stares of Clint Eastwood and Jean Reno's Leon and the Professional. They both have a code, but they're almost up for any contract. Overall, I loved the bones of the story. You know, I had buy-in right from the beginning, but what caused me to pause were some of Boba Fett's choices. Now, I'm hoping, hoping that these were nothing more than mere temporary stall tactics and not some new modus operandi from a guy recovering from a whole hell of a lot of physical trauma. The opening few minutes were 12 minutes that were painted with some incredible visuals, good storytelling, and some deep physical emoting. But, and there's a but, the first 12 minutes were almost completely without dialogue. Now, I enjoy that. But I'm not sure a lot of audience will. You know, that's like my kind of cinema, but it's not for everyone. After that, we learned a lot about Boba's past. Again, what I find as being a treat. But we end up in the middle where he makes some of those questionable choices. So it becomes a mix of uh, good information with way too much filler, especially for a seven-episode season one. And that leads us right into that famous action sequence, which is a solid scene. But the action isn't loud enough to be memorable, nor is it long enough to leave a good impression. It's good, it's solid, but it should have been magnificent. 
if I had to give a recommendation, I'd say, yes, go ahead and watch it. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm going to give it three episodes to see where it leads. But I think Stranger in a Strange Land would have been much, much better served if it had been cut and shown as a 15-minute prologue before episode one. One more thing I'd have to say about it is that the way that Disney put it out in this weekly episodic format, I think, was a big mistake for the book of Boba Fett. It's shot as um, a Western, a spaghetti Western, and an organized crime drama. Well, both of those sometimes can be very slow in between a whole hell of a lot of action. For something like that, they should have released the entire episode lot so we could binge it as an entire movie. Otherwise, what they're asking for is trust. Watch the first episode, then trust us that the next one will be better and the one after that. And I'm not sad to say, but Disney hasn't earned our trust over the last few years. So next time, if you're going to follow the same pattern with the Obi-Wan Kenobi, release the whole damn thing. If you want a chance at winning either a PlayStation 5 or a Nintendo Switch, all you have to do is hit the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. We use a random picker which will choose the video in the comment. It's genuinely random. So the more videos you comment on, the better chance you have of winning. You only have to comment once, but you can increase your chances by commenting once per video. More than that, and it really won't impact the tally from the random picker. So, if you love being a part of Slayer Nation, then I'll continue the giveaways as we battle all the way to the top of the mountain. And we've come to that time in the video. Smash that like button, subscribe, share with your family, friends, and coworkers, and leave your thoughts about the video in the comments down below. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can be informed when we release a new video. And now remember, Never bow down, never bend the knee. Firmly defiant. Step up, stand tall, and get busy living your best life now. Always forward.